Well, uh, hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Brad Hurst. I want to take the time here just to uh, thank you so much for tuning in uh, to this uh, video presentation. This is going to be kind of short. Uh, I'm going to tell you the purpose of this uh, video. Over the last number of months, I've had several people who contacted me asking me to write a blog or produce something with regard to trying to keep you up, people up to speed uh, on the issues in our, the events in the world today as they might or might not relate to Bible prophecy. Uh, I've, I've always wanted to do something like that, but to be quite honest with you, um, most people want me to write a blog and I'm just not, uh, I'm just not a person who's interested in doing a lot of writing. Writing is very difficult to do for me, and uh, I wasn't interested in doing that. But recently, uh, in fact, just a couple days ago, I had a friend of mine uh, contact me uh, talking about the possibility of doing something in video, uh, sort of kind of like a weekly update, uh, something that could be used to try to keep people up to speed with what's going on in the world as it uh, relates to Bible prophecy, that is, if it does relate to Bible prophecy, and, and how that might actually work out. And I was somewhat reluctant to, to begin uh, with, but uh, over time we, we talked and I finally decided to go ahead and do it. Uh, him together with another friend of mine, uh, we, we talked about it and it just seemed to be a, a, a good idea to go ahead and do something like this. So uh, uh, the purpose of this is simply just going to try to keep us up to speed with what's going on in the world and to see if there's any connection with the Bible prophecy and uh, um, you know, if that connection is there, you know, what it might actually be. But before we get into doing anything like that, I want to take some time just to kind of tell you about myself. Uh, I'm not doing this because I want to throw credentials at you or experience or anything like that. I'm doing this because I, I sort of want to kind of set myself apart from some of the other sites that are out there that seem to be relying on uh, innuendo, uh, platitudes, or, you know, some people are having dreams and visions and what have you. You know, I, I don't have any dreams or visions or anything like that. I'm just a regular guy. And uh, I want to be as, as broad and narrow as the scriptures uh, allow us to be. And we want everything to be done within the confines of, you know, the, the worldview of, of the Bible, the Christian worldview, and make sure we keep ourselves in harmony with that. So uh, no dreams, no, no visions or anything like that. Uh, we're not going to be necessarily repeating what other people hear. We just want to look at the... Uh, What's going around us, what the Bible says, and just kind of move from there. So, uh, uh, um, a little bit about myself, uh, my academic background. Uh, well, uh, it, I was uh, I've been a believer for 42 years, and shortly after I became a believer, I, I started going to uh, a Bible college down in Southern California. It's a an accredited college uh, where I got my degree in Bible. Uh, and completed that in 1984, and I have continued my studies in uh, different fields of science and so forth and in the Bible ever since. I've gone on to get uh, um, um, degrees in administration of justice, uh, degrees in uh, um, fire science technology. I've, uh, I'm a graduate of a police academy and a graduate of a, of, a, of a fire academy as well. I've continued to uh, do additional studies in the areas of of science, specifically in biology, uh, botany, and uh, astronomy, with a special emphasis in astronomy. I've studied uh, not only you know modern day astronomy and how it works and so forth, but I've also gone through and done some studies on ancient astronomy and how how they uh, viewed the world back then and how they viewed the sky back then. Uh, in addition to that, I've 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 uh, uh, continued to do studies in areas of uh, uh, ancient Middle Eastern history, specifically in the area of uh, Mesopotamia and ancient Israel, Egypt, and parts of uh, Turkey and Greece and what have you. I've done studies in, uh, continue to do studies in um, biblical languages. I'm currently completing uh, my third year in biblical Hebrew from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and hopefully by this time next year I'll receive my uh, degree and uh, and be considered an expert in Hebrew. Next semester I'll be uh, at the advanced level and then about this time next year I should be completing the um, fourth section of it or the fifth section of it which is actually the, the um, expert level. So uh, I've, I've done some studies uh, with Northwest University on modern Israel and the Torah so forth, um, ancient Israel, uh, um, uh, ancient Jerusalem or what have you. 
all these are through you know universities either in the Middle East or uh, here in the United States so uh, that's sort of my academic credentials uh, you know just sort of in a nutshell again I say that so that you know that I'm not some you know whack job out there you know crackpot who's just relying on dreams and visions or some platitude that they heard from somebody else so uh, my personal life um, as a um, I've been like I said I've been a leader for 42 years I've been married for uh, 29 years be going on 30 here pretty soon uh, my wife it's my this is my first wife and hopefully my only wife hopefully we'll continue to go on for you know until the Lord calls both of us home but uh, um, We've been married for you know almost 30 years now. We have uh, seven kids, all from the same marriage. People ask me that all the time. Uh, most of my kids are grown up and moved out. Uh, the ones that are moved out, uh, as far as I know, they're you know attending the local churches. You know, uh, they some of them are, are married and what have you, and uh, they're very successful in their fields of, of occupation and, and what have you. And my kids that are at home, they're involved in church. Uh, they love you know the Lord. They love church and what have you. And so. Uh, you know, we're not a perfect family by any means, but God has essentially blessed us uh, in ways that, uh, you know, only he could bless us with. So uh, um, in terms of my, my employment, I, you know, starting back in 1984, I actually went to work for the college that I, I graduated from. I actually started that in 1987. I was the uh, superintendent of grounds and later became a liaison for um, campus development and what have you. For the whole school and had several employees under under my supervision and what uh, what have you and uh, from there i went to the uh, city of dublin public works department where i was the lead foreman for the city of dublin public works for both the parks division and the streets division i had some 15 square miles of of, of the city under my shall we say supervision with dozens of employees and contractors and what have you uh, after that, my wife and I, uh, we decided we wanted to be missionaries, and we became missionaries uh, to Central Asia, where we decided uh, we wanted to be involved in starting a seminary that's still there to this day. That was back in 1995. Um, that missionary, that, that, that seminary is still there to this day, and there, there's a church that we started there uh, that's uh, still functioning uh, even to this day. And so uh, that was in Kazakhstan, Almaty area. And we... When we returned from there, we, we came back and I started my business uh, that I had for a number of years and eventually sold that. But during the time of that business, uh, I became a firefighter and, and worked as a, fire, a firefighter for eight years, running the business at the same time. I uh, was a fire department here in the area and I got hired and picked up there and it was a great job until I had a, an injury. Uh, after being a firefighter and selling that business, I went on to become a police officer. And uh, just in God's providence, it, it, I just thought that just wasn't a fit for me. And so uh, uh, God called me out of that ministry. And we came back to this area where I started a second business. And that lasted for a while. And from there, I went on to become a school teacher, working as a long-term sub, uh, assisting and helping with difficult uh, classes and difficult students and getting them under control and bringing them back to the uh, to the school district uh, and helping them with, with that particular need. Uh, my wife went into education as well. She went involved and became a school teacher. And um, uh, during that time, uh, I began starting our third business, uh, which I'm currently employed in and is my main source of income right now. I'm still with the school district, but because of COVID, I've decided just to kind of hang on for a while with that because uh, I just don't want to have to wear a mask if I don't have to. But I've got my third business going, and uh, that seems to be working out just fine for us as of now. So that's me in a nutshell. And again, nobody's tooting a horn here or anything like that. I just It's really important to me for people to understand that what I'm not doing is I'm not out there just, you know, willy-nilly saying things and, and what have you. But uh, and, and in addition to that, you know, I'm not a guy who's been in the employee of the church, you know, my whole life, which is really nothing wrong with that. But I've been in the church. In fact, I've even worked in church while I was in school, but uh, I've been involved with the local fellowship as, you know, as much as I can be involved with. But uh, at the same time, I've worked, I've worked in, in the community. And so, you know, I basically, if you would say, kind of like a man of the world, he kind of knows how things function. But God has still called us to have a Christian testimony and a Christian witness and function in the world as though we were you know, walking among believers. And so uh, that's part of our witness. So anyway, that's just me. 
Okay. I'm sure there's others out there are far more qualified and, and gifted in, in, in areas, you know, that I am in, but uh, uh, that's just me uh, sort of in a nutshell here. So, so with that, I want to, I just want to kind of start off by mentioning a couple different things. All right. <clears throat> Specifically in the area of, of Bible prophecy, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, what this is going to be about. And there are a lot of moving parts when it comes to Bible prophecy. It's kind of think of it like a like a big you know vehicle that moves down the road, and you know there are basically four tires that hit the road, but there's a lot that goes on between those four tires and being able to make the the whole vehicle move. There's steering, there's combustion, there's electronics, there's gears. I mean, there's a you know belts and timers and switches and what have you, and radiators and fans and everything. So. And if you get in, in some cases that one of those parts isn't working or any combination of those parts isn't working, your car's not going to go anywhere. In fact, it might break down so much it doesn't ever go anywhere. So a bioprophecy is kind of like that in that, that there's a lot of moving parts going on. So we can't discuss all the nuances of Bible prophecy all at once. I, I, I mentioned that I don't like to write, but I, I did write a book a number of years back uh, called Systematic Eschatology, uh, the Hermeneutics of Bible the hermeneutics of Bible prophecy. And the purpose of that book was simply just to help provide people with a hermeneutic by which you understand not only the, the elements of the first advent, but the elements of the second advent as well. And if you are interested in reading that book, I'll, I'll provide a link uh, for that down below. I have an online link to it. There were hard copies at one point in time. Uh, it's now in its third edition. And uh, um, that's still available. And I'll give you a link for that. And so you can kind of get a, a bigger picture of how Bible prophecy act actually works. But for purposes of our immediate discussion, there are three things that I want to address that are directly connected to the issue of the rapture, because the rapture itself is sort of kind of like the big bugaboo that's out there. You know, according to a lot of people, the rapture is kind of like the, the big thing that's going to set everything in motion and what have you. And there's, there's a lot of that, there, there's a lot to that that's actually true. But I think that there are some some nuances regarding the rapture that um, that aren't uh, well known or very well understood, and we kind of want to take some time to clear that up. And as if this if this um, video uh, update series is um, you know takes off or anything like that, then we will continue, or I will continue to uh, provide you with updates with regard to world events and what they might mean for us as believers and what they might mean for us with regards to Bible prophecy, if there's any connection whatsoever. And I would encourage you that if you have articles and things that you want to send me, uh, I'm, I'd be glad to get those. The stuff that I get, I get from all over the world. Uh, I get it from an organization called Memory, M-E-R-I, Middle East Research Institute, or Middle East, um, or Middle East, Mem uh, Media Research Institute, Memory, Middle East Media Research Institute. I look at Al Jazeera. I look at the time of of the Times of Israel. I look at the Jerusalem Post. I look at Haaretz, which is another Jewish uh, um, newspaper. I look at Al Monitor. I look at uh, 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 Huriat, which is a, a Turkish news uh, organization. I, I really don't spend a lot of time looking at the the stateside media outlets because Personally, I think that they are, they're lousy journalists, if, they, if there's any journalism whatsoever. But if something does show up, you know, I'll grab hold of it and go in there. Look, I, I read the Christian Post. I read, I mean, there's a, a lot of articles that I get from a lot of different sources. And so uh, uh, if you have something that you would like to send to me, I'd be glad to get that and uh, uh, read through it and, and see what it is. So uh, you could actually just, you know, send it in the, in the comments section uh, below. Uh, I will provide you with an email address as well, where you can send me things um, in, a, in addition to uh, things you might put in the comments below. But when it, now when it comes to the issue of, of the rapture, um, you know, I, I realize think that the rapture can help it. Many people think the rapture can happen at any moment and it's, and it's imminent and what have you, it's going to happen any second and whatever. I, I personally don't believe that. I haven't believed that for probably a better part of, 35 years or so, I do believe that there are there are signs that tell us that the rapture is actually going to happen uh, to be looking for. I believe that actually one of the signs uh, took place back on September 23rd, 2017. I mentioned some of that in my book as well. 
And uh, what I specifically state in that book is that it did seem reasonable that the rapture would happen at that time, but I didn't think it was the case. I did not think it would be the case. I had a couple of friends who have encouraged me to write this or to do this work who, um, uh, you know, basically uh, explained to me that that probably wasn't the case. And so in my book, I make it very clear that I didn't think the rapture was going to happen in connection with, with, that, uh, with that event. But I do think it was a, the sign that tells us that we are at that position or at that point now where to start looking. I do think when that sign took place, uh, something took place in heaven. We had, you know, of course, we had the sign, the sun and the moon and 12 stars, the woman, the travailing woman and what have you, and the dragon. And I explain all that in other videos that I've got. I explain some of it in my book as well. But I do think that when that happened, something actually happened in heaven. And I do believe there's a war in heaven taking place right now. And that uh, that war is underway. And the enemy, uh, the devil, is accusing the brethren even as we speak. And at some point in time, that battle is going to be over. And when that battle is over, Satan's going to be cast out of heaven. And those who are to be raptured, notice how I said that carefully, those who are to be raptured uh, are going to be raptured up at that point in time. And I think that we are uh, approaching that day. But there are other signs besides that that I think that are uh, signs that tell us that the rapture is impending. And one of those signs that we find in 1 Thessalonians, I, I believe it's 1 Thessalonians, if it's 2 Thessalonians, I, I apologize. But in Thessalonians, we are told that regarding, you know, the day of the Lord and our gathering together unto him, that that day will not happen until there be a falling away first and a man of sin be revealed. Right? I, I just don't know how people get around that. I, I, I really don't. Okay? Our, the day of Christ and our gathering together unto him. That day is not going to happen until there is a falling away first and a man of sin be revealed. Now, I did an, uh, a, a while back, I did a, a something on YouTube, and you can see it uh, on my YouTube page, that... What, what does it mean when you talk about the falling away? Well, the word there is apostasia, right? And and there is there are a lot of people out there who want to say that, that itself is actually talking about the departure, okay? The the rapture itself that it's actually the departure. There is no grammatical or linguistic credibility to that whatsoever, none. Okay, you go and look at the Greek. I looked at the Greek myself. I I'm not a Greek expert, but I got the tools out there. There is literally no grammatical, no linguistic validity to that statement whatsoever. In fact, in, in um, 1 Timothy 4.1, we were told that in the last days, many are going to depart from the truth or fall away from the truth. And we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. The old Westminster Confession hermeneutic, okay, that we use the scripture to interpret the scripture. So when you have one place where we're talking about the departure or the falling away, and then over here, we have another section that talks about people departing and falling away, that it, and they use the same language, we have a reasonable expectation that, uh, that they're talking about the same thing, specifically say, since it's talking about, the, both are talking about the last days. And so what we see in that particular passage is we're talking about the, the departure, all right? We're talking about the falling away is what we're talking about. Now, there are a couple of other things that are also important with regard to understanding the timing of, of the rapture. That would also be the man of sin being revealed. And I do want to spend some time on that, but not in this particular video. Uh, and um, the, the uh, shall we say, the, the future of the state of the nation of Israel. There are, there are things in the scriptures that are very specific or that are specifically telling us what's going to happen to Israel just prior to the rapture itself. Okay, And when we get to that part or we get to that section, I, I think a lot of people are going to be shocked uh, to, to actually see this. They're going to wonder where their pastors have been all, in all of this. So... Uh, uh, there are things that are going to happen with the nation, the state of Israel. They're going to catch the un, or they're going to catch the Christian world by surprise, and are going to stun many people. So I want to sort of kind of do this update series type thing 
uh, surrounding those three issues, the, the departure or the great apostasy, the falling away, the rise of the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. Did you know the scripture actually tells us where he comes from? And, and it tells us which direction he goes and the countries he's involved with. And I'm going to tell you right off the bat, it's not what you think. I was shocked to find this out myself. In fact, just recently, I was surprised to find out just how detailed the Old Testament is with regard to this guy and how Paul in his description of this guy is relying upon Old Testament passages. So um, we're going to get into that and then also we're gonna, we will get into a point of talking about Israel as well. But for today's video, I want to just begin by talking about the, the departure, okay, the falling away. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, what, what, what is this falling away uh, talking about? Well, as I mentioned, some people want to say it's talking about the rapture, but again, there's no linguistic uh, reason to think that. No grammatical, no linguistic reason whatsoever to actually think that. So uh, if, if that's not what it's talking about, and to be honest with you, that, that's, a, that's a classic example of vice of Jesus. You know, they have this idea that, well, nothing can happen before the rapture, but we have something over here that tells us that the rapture isn't going to happen until, or at least, the, you know, our gathering together unto him isn't going to happen until this departure takes place. So that, that departure, it can't be what we think, what it actually says it is. It has to be something else. And since I have this idea of what the rapture is going to be like and how it's going to develop and it's imminent and there's no signs, what have you, I got to figure out a way to explain the way this departure that's supposed to happen before the, are gathering together unto him, or our rapture. So that's what you call eisegesis. It's having this idea behind in your head already, looking at a passage that seems to conflict with that, and then reinterpreting that passage in lieu of your idea. Okay, we don't want to do that. All right, we want to make sure that we bring our our minds and our eschatology, and our all of our theology into compliance with the scriptures. So when it's talking about um, uh, a departure, a fallen away, First Timothy chapter four, verse one, or as Paul says in Thessalonians, it's it's literally talking about a a. It's not just it's not just a a a generalized event. It's actually a specific event. In fact, I I did a video on this um, a while back, and it's if you want a, a longer video, you can go look at that. But this this departure, this falling away, this apostasia, it's an open rebellion, is what it is. And it's 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 an embracing it's 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 a it's a case where where you had people who embraced and were champions of what was considered to be an orthodox position, who now no longer embrace that. They don't just sort of fall away from that and go off into oblivion. They they not only no longer embrace it, but they're now over here advocating and and against it. So they were over here enthusiastically embracing. Now they're over here enthusiastically opposing that which they once enthusiastically embraced. So they're active. They're, they're very active. And there are two components to this. One, and, and, and you, could, you could easily be involved in just one and not the other, or you can be involved in both. One of these components is theological, all right? It's uh, it's a theological has a theological component, and what I mean by that is that at one point in time you embraced that which was considered to be orthodox theology, and then for whatever reason you no longer embrace it, you now have moved away from a an unorthodox position, and not only are you into that position, you are actively um, advocating it and opposing that which you once held on to. I want now here's something that's that's uh, I think very, very telling for us. Uh, about a year ago, Lincolnier Ministries uh, had a, a research uh, poll done for them, uh, put together by a Pew Research Company. And they do this poll every couple years. They've been doing this for about uh, at, well, at the time, it would have been six years. And they released this every couple of years. It's called the State of Theology. They didn't just go out there and go to just any local branch church or anything like that. They actually went to, quote unquote, 
fundamental evangelical church is to see where the state of theology is at, to see where it's at in those organizations, in those categories, or in those groups of people. And, um, <laughs> I, you know, I expected there to be some negative news, but I did not expect to see what we actually got. After doing that research poll, one of the things that uh, they asked about it was, uh, how, what was your view of Jesus? And specifically, they asked the question, do you see Jesus as God? Is Jesus God? Okay, what do you think regarding the deity of Christ? Not, not is he just a deity, but what do you think of the person of Christ? Is he God in the flesh? Now, these are fundamental evangelical churches, okay, that probably you and I would feel comfortable going to. But when contacting people that were parts of those churches, here's what they found out. 30% of those surveyed said that they do not believe that Jesus is God. All right, this isn't wacky-do, this is a wacky-do Baptist church down the street. This would be at a fundamental Baptist church, a conservative evangelical church, conservative IFCA church, okay, or reformed church, okay? 30% do not believe in the person of Christ. We are very quickly headed back to the Aryan position that was debated back in 315 AD, right? We are very quickly headed back to that position. With regard to the issue of total depravity, an issue that was debated and discussed and codified back during the Pelagian controversy of 425 AD, 46% reject the concept of total depravity. 46% of Bible, supposedly Bible-believing uh, churches, people in the churches, reject total depravity. Here's one for you. This is the last one I'll give. There are other issues, but I think was to keep us brief as brief as I can. 22%, 22% of people in these churches believe that gender is a matter of choice. 22%. Now, I have a lot of kids, and I still have some teenage kids, and they bring their friends over from church. I can tell you for a fact that most of these kids coming in would be, would be at best confused regarding this particular issue. Okay, And it's because of the wokeism that's coming in to our seminaries, our church, parachurch organizations, our mega churches so forth and so on, at the top. 22% can't really come up or discern rightly when it comes to the issue of gender identity, all right? So in doctrinal issues, we are seeing an apostasy, but it's not an apostasy of like, I, I just don't wanna to go to church anymore. There is an open rebellion actively embracing things that were once considered heresy in the church. Actively embracing those things now. But that's not the only manner of apostasy that we see. You know, we, we talk often about um, wolves in sheep's clothing, and we're being warned against these guys and so forth. And thankfully, you know, there are plenty of people out there who are doing that. We, we tend to look at these guys like Joel Osteen and uh, <laughs> uh, I forget the guy, uh, Bill Hybels and Rick Warren and what have you. And the, all of these guys, you know, the Jimmy Bakers and the Jim Swaggerts and what have you else. All of these guys as being, you know, the wolves in sheep's clothing. Look, th those aren't wolves in sheep's clothing. Those are wolves in wolves clothing. All right. They don't, they don't look like us. I mean, they don't. They, they have a semblance of our theology, but they don't look like us at all. Okay, the wolves in sheep clothing that we're actually beginning to see start to unfold now actually look like us. One of the biggest ones to come around or to be exposed just recently is Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias, the big apologist, and everybody was this and that, and he was something else, and 
he could articulate the Christian position and his orthodoxy and what have you. I mean, to to the ends of the earth. Okay, we have other examples of of these guys from Moody Bible Institute, presidents there, people on the board, people on staff, professors, Cedarville College. Okay, the big Christian organization, you know, Cedarville College coming out of Grand Rapids and things with the with the the president there and what have you. And there, I mean, there are things with uh, critical race theory that are being embraced by Reformed Theological, I'm not Reformed, um, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest um, non-Catholic denomination in, in the country. We have things with these parachurch organizations uh, that, are, that are embracing things like critical race theory and what have you. But, but more, more desperate than that, what we have going on in these organizations, we have these guys who can, they can, they can embrace our orthodoxy and become champions for our orthodoxy and write books and periodicals and have seminars and so forth and what have you for our orthodoxy. But when you look on the inside of not only them, their personal lives, but the organizations that they're running and they're involved with, what you see is a culture of greed and corruption. Okay, these organizations, these mega churches, maybe not mega churches, some of these smaller churches, these parachurch organizations, the universities, the Christian colleges, so forth, the missions agencies, it is staggering to see what's actually going on. Okay, I'm not a big fan of Russ Moore, but what Russ Moore did with regard to the Southern Baptist Convention and his expose of what's going on. Thank God for what he's doing. And because he specifically says it's it's to protect our children. The pedophilia among these organizations, the sexual sin, the the, the money, the lying, the blackmailing, the blacklisting, listing, the doxing that goes on with these people or that these people are engaged in and so forth. It's just, it is so antithetical to Christian practice that it's hard to believe that, that people, more people can't see what's actually going on. Because we end up getting involved and getting attached to our celebrity pastors. Our, my pastor, wouldn't do that. You know, he's a pastor of a mega church and what have you, and, and what have you, but my pastor wouldn't do that. Well, don't be so sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sure that maybe there are some mega church pastors out there who really are uh, sincere and what have you, but Right now, I mean, it just seems like every day, not every week, not every month, but every day the Christian Post or somebody is posting something about what's going on with these mega church organizations. Hillsong Group, what's going on with them and all the stuff that's that's been they've been involved with. Or how about Sovereign Grace Ministries and what's been going on with them and all the things that are going are involved with that. Not to mention the Southern Baptist Convention and the, the culture of corruption all throughout these organizations, from the from the top to the bottom, okay? Um, it, it just seems to me, and it seems as though it's it's evident in these in these churches that that these churches are being given over to their wealth, they're being given over to lies, okay, and they're being given over to sex, and they're being given over to um, power. Okay? Sex lies, money, and power. That seems to be what they're being given over to. Because when you look in these congregations and you actually find, you know, believers in there who <laughs> just, they, they seem to be power horses, powerhouses in the word, both in, 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 their, in their theology and in their practice and the way they conduct themselves and the way they conduct their families. But you never seem to find these guys on the elder boards. It's always the businessman that's on the elder board. You know, the guy, Mr. Practical Applicator, who can tell you the difference between the Trinity and a, and a tricycle. Those are the guys that are actually on the elder board. Not the guy who's got, you know, not the guy who's who's got, you know, the gift of whatever. I mean, not the guy who's a gifted teacher and has his theology, you know, dialed in and is a powerhouse in the word and his kids are walking with the Lord and he's, you know, his business practices is are 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 
you know, above board and he's got a good rep. You don't find those guys on your elder boards. You find the businessmen. Okay. And that seems to be pretty much everywhere in these churches. And what is ironically funny or, or sad about this is, is that we don't, we don't have a doctrine of repentance anymore, at least not a biblical doctrine of repentance. Because you've got these guys on board at the top, I think the church has lost its ability to discern. I mean, and I mean almost straight across the board. When it comes to issues of sin, when something blows up in their face, yeah, you know, they got to deal with it. But when there's an issue that a family's having with maybe their kid or if there's a struggle between, you know, families or something like that, or when there's, when there's, um, you know, someone's caught in something somewhere and all of a sudden they say, well, you know, I'm sorry. And well, he's repentant and he said he's sorry. And, uh, you know, we asked them about it and he said he didn't do it and what have you. You've got to ask yourself, where is the discernment among these people? And the net result of that is that this has worked itself out in the church and that we now actually have a church that at the, you know, in the pulpit, they're going to preach orthodoxy and they're going to preach biblically in, in, in most cases. But when it comes down to the, to the inner workings and the nuances, there really is a fruitless gospel out there. You literally have people telling people, people in leadership telling you that you can actually be saved for all your life. Okay, and show little fruit, if any, but you're still going to go to heaven and nobody can judge you for it. Okay, I actually personally heard somebody say that. Okay, and it wasn't received too well when I actually brought that to not only their attention, but to, to people's attention and leadership. That, I mean, that's where we're at. And if you think that those types of people don't have an influence on the congregation, they do. To be quite honest with you, that's actually prevailing thinking among almost all believers today that you can't judge, and that if someone says that they're repentant, you just have to believe it. And they, they make this next nexus between repentance and forgiveness and trust. Where if somebody sins, I realize that, and they repent, okay? I'm obligated by the scriptures to forgive them. Okay? I understand that. I believe that. But I'm not obligated to trust them. Forgiveness and repentance and trust are not all together. And another thing too is we have to understand is that repentance is something that's demonstrated over time. It's not when you're caught, oh, I'm sorry, and the next day everybody just moves on like nothing happened. But that's the way people actually think. And somehow or another you're considered to be unloving and uncaring and what have you. And as a result of that, we have lost our biblical doctrine of repentance. There's a book out there that's called The Doctrine of Repentance. And I think it's... Uh, I think it was uh, put out by John Owen. I actually bought it at the church that I was at uh, uh, for a number of years and where this issue came up. I actually bought it there. But uh, it didn't seem to make any difference when when I was confronted with some of the issues I was confronted with. So so uh, it, we are at a, we're at a junction right now, folks. Not only do we have a doctrinal departure taking place at a much, much significant level we have a christian living departure taking place and it's it, that the it the fan that's flaming it is at the top it's at the pastoral level it's at the elder level it's at the institute level this idea that somehow or another we can get out there and preach against you know someone like rob bell who has a book that says love wins and we should preach against that okay but in reality, when it comes down to the practitioners, or shall we say the people in their church with regard to sin, what do we have over here? Love wins. Okay? We have love wins. Doctrinally, we oppose love wins. But over here, we embrace it. Because you have people in the regular practice of sin who are running to the church leadership complaining that somebody is trying to hold them accountable or complaining that somebody is too hard on them. I remember a particular case where I don't want to get into the, the nuance of the sin because it's it's so egregious. When I when I actually brought it up, okay, and this person admitted this sin that he had been involved in, a guy who was a pastor, he actually admitted it. 
Okay? And he says, but I didn't do this. I remember just looking at him, just saying, you're out of your mind, and having the, the, the two pastors that were there saying, well, he says he didn't do it, so, you know, we believe him. Really? I mean, that's the level of thinking that we're at, at the top. Okay? And the reason why we're there is because I personally believe, I believe the church has been given over to its money, its sex, its lies, and its in its desire for power, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. It's everywhere. Okay? You can't go anywhere today or look on, on the internet anywhere or news source anywhere today and not expect to see some story where some pastor has been caught with his pants down again or some elder or some kid has been molested and the church is trying to trying to, instead of dealing with the damage done to the church and the family, the pastor in the church and the elder bards over there trying to put a lid on it to keep the reputation of the church from being damaged. They don't care that the kid's been damaged, okay? And they're trying to handle a, a criminal act through a e ecclesiastical fashion. This is that departure that I'm talking about. A departure of not only doctrine, but practice. I mean, just in the case I'm telling you about, okay? God has an authority that's established to prosecute those things. It's called the civil authorities, not the church. But the church is so cattywampus right now because it's been given over to its money, its power, its sex, and its lies. All throughout from top to bottom the corruption is just staggering and what is what is fascinating about this this research poll that i looked at with the, the pew research poll at the time which was in back in 2020 is that this this the 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 the, the departure from orthodox theology has has gone on it, it has grown exponentially in the last six years Right around the time that the great sign of September 23rd, 2017, you know, started to show up. But just in the last four years or so, this massive departure from, from practice among the clergy and also among the, the uh, um, laity has grown by probably tenfold two, three, four hundred percent, especially at, at the, shall we say, the, the, the leadership level. It just, it's just unbelievable where we're at right now. You know, I, I, like I said, I've been a believer now for 42 years. I can remember a time when I was at a church down in Southern California, big church, very, very large church. It was uh, uh, about 2,200 people or so. And, and one of the things that I remember is is that the, the senior pastor, every Monday, he went out visiting. He, he took people, notes from people who, who said they wanted, wanted a visitation. He would call them. He would arrange the meeting. And he'd go out and visit them. He would do this every Monday. And uh, there was a, a group of us that were involved with that. There was probably maybe eight of us. And uh, they were broke up in teams. And sometimes I actually went with the senior pastor to visit people just to visit them, to see who they were in their homes and what was going on and what they were doing. Not, not for any other reason, just to get to know the people who are in the church and so they can get to know you. Um, I can tell you right now that um, probably in the last 30 years, uh, I've not seen that. We now have a top-down thinking mentality in the church that is destroying the church. The best people in the, in the congregation are the people in the congregation. They're sitting in the pews. One of the things I tell my kids is that that guy in the pew, you can listen to what he's saying because he's going to say the right things most likely. But it's the people in the pews who are going to set the example for you. Right? And that that's basically the way we need to function today. I want to thank, um, I've never met these people, but there are there are some people who have, kind of like in the last maybe three or four years who've sort of spearheaded uh, 
a, an organized um, sort of a, a clarion call to call the church away from these people who need to be fired, okay? Away from these these individuals who are sitting on these little boards who need to be removed. Uh, these these people that I'm going to mention here in just a minute have done a, a powerful job at documenting and interviewing and researching incidents of, of pastoral abuse, clergy abuse, institutional abuse, uh, and so forth, and the greed and the corruption and, uh, across the board, at least here in the United States, some cases beyond. And I want to take the time just to thank them. I've, I've never talked to any of them, uh, but just put this out there for, so you can go actually and look at their stuff as well. I get some of my information from them, and I've listened to, to a number of them. But uh, um, uh, probably the, 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 the leading person doing this, they're all women. I mean, <laughs> Well, I, I, well, I take that back, okay, with the exception of one. Most of them are women. Uh, one of them is Julie Royce, uh, R-O-Y-S. She has a website called The Royce Report. She does a podcast. There are some things in there that, you know, obviously you're not going to agree with everything. There are some things that she's, she's said and done that, you know, I, I question whether or not she should have done it or not. But I'm going to say that, that overall, I think that she's done a tremendous job at documenting what's been going on within the world of Christendom. Uh, over, and she's only been doing this, you know, for the last number of years. Once working at Moody Bible Institute, exposing Moody Bible and what was going on and James McDonald, uh, she began to uh, she began to, uh, to document more issues. And she now has a full-time ministry where she is an investigative journalist who is documenting what's been going on in the world of Christianity over the number of years. Another one is uh, uh, Rachel Den Hollander, uh, one of the abuse victims of Larry Nasser from Michigan State University. Uh, she did a, an expose of what's been going on in uh, the Sovereign Grace Ministries and uh, other mega churches across the country. She's an attorney, a victim advocate, and her husband's a pastor. I think in the OPC, uh, or at least in the Presbyterian Reformed Church churches as well. So. Uh, uh, She's a great source, Rachel, Rachel Den Hollander. Uh, another uh, person out there is um, Diane Langsberg. Uh, she's a, a sociologist, a psychologist, a therapist who has spent decades uh, um, counseling and, and helping uh, victims of pastoral abuse, specifically women who have been sexually abused by people in church and uh, uh, people who were at one point in time children in these churches who were sexually abused by their leadership. Uh, she's gone through and explains to you the patterns of abuse and how churches cover these things up and they they end up going after the victim, uh, trying to uh, protect their reputations. That is the reputation of the church. To a lesser degree, uh, uh, a woman who I've actually talked to, uh, T.C. Cannon, who shares her experience, uh, just like you, you heard it, T.C., T.I., or shall I say T.E.S.I., Cannon, like in the word Cannon, uh, she shares her experience, and she's the one that got me uh, connected uh, to Julie Roy's website and to uh, just uh, Julie or Diane Langsbird, and then also Russ Moore. Uh, I've never talked to Russ Moore. Uh, I, some of the stuff he does, I'm not a real big fan of, but kudos to him for coming out and exposing the uh, Southern Baptist Convention the way he has. So uh, I would we're going to spend some more time on this particular issue before we get into. Uh, Doctrine of Antichrist, but, but ladies and gentlemen, I think it's safe to say that the, the great apostasy is underway. Okay, It has exponentially grown uh, in the last four or five years. And uh, I expect it to get even worse to the point now uh, to where it's going to be difficult to... I used to think that the church was a safe place for my kids. I no longer think that. I mean, let's just put it that way. Okay. Uh, when you look at some of these websites and some of these people, the, the shall we say, the hunting ground for pedophiles is now the local church. And the church is notoriously bad at dealing with it. But it's because we have people in there who lack the discernment, who don't have the ethics, who don't have the qualifications to serve and so forth and what have you. Okay? We have this bad idea concerning love and peace and repentance and 
so forth, that is simply just not biblical. And uh, um, these women and one man uh, have issued forth a clarion call to, to repentance and uh, sort of kind of, we want to do that, but I do realize that Bible prophecy has to unfold and it's going to unfold the way it's supposed to unfold. The, the church is essentially going to, there's going to be a massive departure from the truth and from practice. And we are, if it's not happening now, we are on the cusp of it. But I don't know how, how it would look any different if it were not happening now. So thank you for your time. And I'm um, sorry this was longer than I expected, but uh, I hope that this is helpful. Well, I will be doing these, these weekly um, broadcasts. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to put them out on Wednesday night or if I'm going to put them out on Friday night. But I want to do these weekly broadcasts. And uh, if you have articles you'd like to send to me, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have a link uh, below this uh, for a, a website, or not a website, but my email. And uh, I'll also have a link to my book, Systematic Eschatology, so you can go have a look at that as well. So God bless and thank you for, for your time.